Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato, Red Shull, Dave Honorado. Today's video is entitled Big Amp, Small Amp, or No Amp. Now, you guys can see behind me, I have a lot of big amps, and I have a bunch of small amps, although the small amps you can't really see. There's an AC30 back there. There's Skylark. 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 There's my, my Blackface Deluxe, even though it's Silverface, but Peter Stroud modded that, and that's a killer Killer sounding. You've got a few other ones. Deluxe. I got I got other ones here. They're kind of hidden, but I also have some really big amps that sound amazing, like my new Park amp here. And orange yeah, we were just playing orange. that one actually. JCM eight hundred. JCM eight hundred. My sound series. You can't eight. really see. I've got Soft a tuck. I got a Mesa dual rectifier two channel, the real good one, <laughs> which has been modded too. A lot of these amps have actually been modded, but I am a fan of big amplifiers. I'm, I make no bones about it. I have about, I don't know, 10, 12, 4, 12 cabs. I've just owned them forever. When I was playing in a band, I had four 4, 12 cabs um, with yeah. two Marshall heads that I played. That was kind of my rig. And I love the sound of a 4, 12 cab. I love I love closed back cabs, but I love open back cabs too. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, recording my AC30 mm -hmm. and micing the back of it, putting the, the mic yeah. out of phase and... Yeah. and uh, I think it's, you know, I like real amplifiers, but there is now things like Kempers. There are the Axe FX, mm -hmm. Helix, Line Helix six. Line 6. Yeah. Bias and FX, Amplifier. Mm -hmm. um, then you have things like um, Universal Audio oh, yeah, yeah. Has, yeah, yeah, yeah. has some really great plugins yeah. that uh, uh, emulate the... Um, Silver Jubilee, for example, they got do, a tweed pack. They got a tweed pack. They have yep. Pete Thorne has his own signature yes. Sir the amp. Sirs, those yep. are great, yeah. And uh, those are really great sounding too. But I want to talk to these guys and get their opinion on why they like what. I mean, we were just playing uh, the park and my GCM eight hundred at about how many dB? You think that was, Dave? Oh, hundred dB. Hundred dB. Yeah. Yeah. About 100 dB. I had, a, I had it at 5 and went to 8, and you were like this. So I was like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it out. It's but a, it was sounding great. It sounded amazing. It sounded yeah. amazing. It sounded like Nam, except, except <laughs> it was loud. Dude, it was louder than Nam. It was louder than Nam. They, 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 was, wouldn't, they wouldn't let him do that. Yeah. yeah. No it was louder than Nam, but it yeah. sounded way better than yeah. Nam. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, sure. no offense to Nam, that is. Yes. So, so Dave, you want to start off on this? Um, well, I, I'm a diehard big amp fan. Um, I started as a small amp guy, but then obviously went to big amps. And uh, I, could, I can honestly say when I moved here to Atlanta uh, in 1990, the first two years that I had an apartment had no furniture whatsoever. <laughs> what you, you sitting on 412s? Oh, I, or what? Yes. I had, I had six 412 Marshall cabinets. <laughs> All array of colors, red, black, jubilees. I had, yeah, I, mean, I had an orange cab. I had green amp cabs. So that's what people said on when they Yeah, literally, we, I, the first, like, six months, I remember taking the, I had an original orange cab, and I flipped it down, and that was the coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> and we had some lawn chairs. What, on the back of it, right? Yeah, on the, the back, yeah. yeah. And I just put drapes up over it, and people come over, and they're like, what is and it? And they're like, oh, an orange cab. And they're like, like no, it's my coffee table. <laughs> it's like, wow. But no, I, I yes, I'm... Die Hard, you know, because originally all my heroes, you know, Clapton, Hendrix, The Who. I mean, you, you know, if you didn't have a big amp, you couldn't play. That was the right, you know. So, um, but what I later found out, uh, obviously, as of going down the road, was, uh, you know, the bigger the amp, the more you have to play that amp. Right. And you, you have to know how to play a big amp. It's, yeah. it's totally different than a small amp. Yeah. It's totally different than, obviously, you know, like a Kemper or something like that. So, it shows all your indiscretions you can't hide anything with it so you for me the big amps when i got on big amps it really whipped me in the shape as a player quick because it was like okay i love this great loud amp now it just shows off everything i can't play right so i better learn how to you know control it play it mm -hmm. you know my technique got way better on a, on a big loud amp very quickly because you 
you use your volume control, at least for me, it was much more volume control. Like, okay, you know. Well, it's kind of like and, being in a club, and when the bass player makes a mistake, everybody yeah, knows, knows it. it. Right. Yeah. Right? Because yes. the bass just travels through everything. With a right. guitar player, he can screw up and everything. And, you know, when a band's playing, so yeah, yeah. I played a round chord, but nobody's really looking. Yeah, you just do some shape and go, yeah, I meant to do that, you know. But or do it Bass players, like, can't, yeah. Now, what about things like uh, Jimmy Page playing a Supro on the early records? Well, and I was just going to say, you know, of course, as a kid, I'm thinking, oh, all these guys use these huge amps to cut with. And then when you realize later on, that they're yeah they're using basically you know like a Skylark sized amp on a lot of that. The first two Zeppelin records were Supro little tiny Supros. Uh, Billy Gibbons cut with a Tweed Deluxe on a lot of early stuff, so it was just a small Tweed Deluxe. But he was using you know hundred watt Super Leads live. Um, you know, I the thing about being amps that I love is it, more than anything is probably pushing air. That's because to me that's rock and roll. You hear that you get hit with your like. Okay, man. You know it's. Well, I said I was saying to Dave the park, for example. Yes. Well, and the eight hundred, but oh, the yeah, park, yeah. the park has this push. Yes, it's like you like get a this, high watt. Right, you get this wallop as you lay into the guitar, depending on how you how much you lay into it. You get this whoop before you even hit the chord comes out. So it's it's like this power surge, and it only thing I can you know surmise it to is like it's like a hot rod car you know you, yeah. you lay into a car and it just pins you and it's that pinning of the you know it's the same thing with the guitar it hits you right here if you've got a 412 stacked and it's loud you it's, know it's and, concussive it is it's, it's, you yeah. feel it in your yeah. chest that's like that part especially yeah. um there's something in that mid-range that's just like a mid-range thump that hits you yeah. right here and what i what i always liked about these bigger amps live was that if you had a drummer that was a real basher you know, and he was just like, yeah, okay. You, know, you could keep up with them, and not only oh, keep yeah. up with you could be like, okay, I got you, man. You try to keep up with this, you know, and they would give you that look like, man, you know. And, and so to me, that was always fun because, you know, you were like, you could actually keep up with the drummer, but, you know, with smaller amps, you get to the gig and like, well, we're going to have to put you through the monitors and crank all this up, and it's not the same, you know. Um, I like... I like a loud stage volume, not piercingly bad, you know, loud, just but a nice loud stage volume and not as much monitor. I like to use the room a lot more for guitar. Now vocals and everything else is obviously different, but for guitars to me, like having in-ears and it being right here, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people who like that. You know, it's like very much like something's wrong. Oh, it's I'm missing the, the air yeah. and the, the distance of the cabinet to where I'm standing and all that. So um, now I, I, I will say this that that I, I've had these thoughts like uh, the Journey Escape record. Neil Schoen's guitar solo sound amazing on there. And I got to meet Jonathan Kane one time, probably about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago or so. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend was uh, went out to dinner with him, and I was invited, and he was keyboard, yeah. keyboard player Journey. And I said to him, I said, what kind of amp was Neil playing for his solos on that record? I figured it's like some type of Marshall, right? And he said, you're not going to believe it. I said, what? He goes, that was a Roland Cube. I said, What? He said, yeah. we tried all these amps, and that one cut perfectly. Yeah, solid I, state, no less. Solid state. Mm. And his guitar tone is amazing on his solos. Yeah. He said Marshalls, they played yeah, yeah. for the rhythm tracks and everything. But to get that to to where it sounded separate from the... Yeah, where it really cut through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, a, was a rolling cube. Well, and you can, I mean, I'm sure, obviously, they had great compression and they had a really, oh, yeah. you know, nice mic prees and yeah, go through, but through, still, through Neves and stuff. But I, I can tell you right now, I have a solid state trainer amp from like the early 80s. Same kind of thing. It's a, it's a 110 little 50 watt thing that big. And when you dime it out, flat out, I have yet to have anybody go, oh, that's a solid state amp. They well, always like, think it's tube. They're like, well, how's it? And I'm like, no, the early solid state stuff actually. Well, like Ty Tabor with the L5s, the Norland. Right, the Lab, the, the, the totally, lab yeah. Series yeah, L5, exactly. Ty Tabor from King's X would play it. Right, right, right. And yeah. I owned one of those before. It has yeah. a compressor built in, and they are great sounding yeah. amps. Uh, uh, Ronnie, Loud, too. Yeah, Ronnie Montrose had full stacks of those L, those Your Lab Series, series amps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he had two 412s and the 120-watt heads. And I mean, if you go back and listen to like his mid '70s, uh, it was after Mont the early Montrose stuff, but like Gamma and some of those other bands that he had, the live stuff. I mean, you listen to it, and you're like, if you didn't know it, you would go, yeah, that's a Marshall. Well, it's they had the the L5. I had a, they had a 212 and I think 410 yeah. version, but then they had the L7. I want to say 115. Yeah, and then and they a, have the L3. The L3, yes. Yeah. yeah. So these are amps that were out in the late '70s. Late '70s, they were Moog. That's who designed them. Yeah. Yeah. Phil Moog designed them. And yeah. they had built in compressor, and the compressor was the coolest thing about it. It was amazing. Because you could peg them like all, like you, 
all the knobs like flat out, but then you pack this compressor into it, and it would somehow it did something weird to the sound. It, it made it, it really, really cool. did, and that's really like Ty's sound is really that compressor. Yeah, and um, when you hear those Kings X on on some of those early records yeah, and, and the super tight guitars, and it had this multiplex knob, which I think was basically like a mid sweep. Mid sweep, yeah. Uh, but those were crucial to that amp, you know, and. Um, and it's great because those amps are still around cheap, and, and if you know how to run them right, they're well, they are. Great. They used they were cheap until this. Well, <laughs> yeah, until today. <laughs> well, all right, they were five hundred bucks. I mean, uh, now you've never heard of these, right? I've never. BB no. King used one for yeah. years. That was his yep. name too. Yeah, so. I'm not. I'm not hip to that. But yeah. um, so, Rhett, what's your what's your take on this on this small amp versus big amp versus no amp? I like all three. I mean, I know that's not a you know. We're not gonna. Like, Why well, could have said that? Yeah, no, man. but see, okay. <laughs> it like depends. Too. It depends on the situation. Okay, so yeah. like on, on my channel a couple months ago, I did a video on the yeah. Gibson Skylark. I have a '64 Skylark, actually almost identical to this one, except mine has the the tremolo circuit in it, and which we found out about from Dave. Yes, all credit goes to to this guy right here I was for a Gibson amp fanatic. So I'm yeah, and I'm and that amp is amazing to record with yeah. because. You turn it all the way up, you hit it with a fuzz pedal, you mic it up with a 57 or a 57 and a condenser, and it sounds massive. Uh, and and the, the kind of the idea of the video that I did was talking about why small amps are great, which is you can get massive sounds out of them out of a really small package. Um, but my main amp that I've been touring with and using live for like the last three years is a divided by 13 FTR 37. That's a big amp, it's 37 watts, class A, and it's it's so loud. It's it's really really loud, and it does that concussive mid range yeah. thump thing that this park does. Yeah, yeah. But I've found myself in the last year not playing that amp live as much because every gig I play, it doesn't matter what the artist is, it doesn't matter <laughs> what the room is. I've played <laughs> festival stages, I've played small clubs, I played loud. theaters. Every single time I get asked to turn down by everybody. I even tour with a baffle of shame. <laughs> I take it with me. And just, yeah. I inadvertently set it up in front of my amp. And it, I still get told to turn down. And in fact, it, it's gotten so bad. Last week, I played a show. And I had my I was playing a 5E3 Tweed Deluxe. 112 combo. What, 12, 14 watts? Yeah, like 14 like watts. 15 watts, yeah. And that was too loud for the band and You're for just the front the of house. Well, the thing is, everybody's expecting people to play exactly. modeling it or yeah. you know uh, right. profiling it. Everybody, whatever. and it's it's a lot of it has to do with the singers and and, and everything. And so yeah, I, some of the stuff I do is with on in ears, and in that way you can kind of get away with a little more stage volume. But uh, and then I also have a Kemper, yeah. and um, I just got a, a Line Six Helix, and I think those are are great for certain situations as well. So I mean. I guess it just depends on what you're trying to do. If I had my way, I would be playing 412s and 100 watts. Okay, so but so one of the things is that I, I have the space here for, because I have a big ISO booth that has 412, four 412 set up always, yeah. that I can go in and I put the head in the control room. And since there's a floating floor between them, there's just no, you don't hear any sound. I can crank a 100 watt Marshall on 10, yeah, right. you don't hear it. You just don't, even though it's right next to it, and there's two glass doors. And it, it, I, have a, I have a video coming out with Tim Pierce. Uh, I interviewed Tim, and I was at his studio, and he has his uh, he has an ISO booth with a uh, with a four twelve, and he was running a park. Mm -hmm. I walked in and said, "That sounds amazing." And he was talking about the same thing. He likes big cabs and big mm -hmm. big and moving he, air. Yeah, he loves moving air. Yeah. And uh, you know, people that I was, I was, I was mentioning to Dave. I went to see Brendan O'Brien play at this small club, Smith's Old Bar. What is it? Two hundred fifty people. Oh, old. maybe. Yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. a two hundred cap room. So those of you that don't know Brendan, Brendan produced everything. Well, he recorded the first Black Crows, a couple Black Crows records, was amazing. He did, and he recorded, mixed Blood Sugar, Sex Magic, and then produced basically all the Pearl Jam records, all the Stone Temple Pilot, mixed, you know, Super Unknown, yep. and did Audio Slave, did. King's X, Dog King's Man. X, yeah, Dogman, which yeah. is amazing. So, and Brendan's a phenomenal guitar player. So, he would do a cover gig on on Thanksgiving night. He did it for about three years in a row with this guy Rick Richards. Yeah, he was in the original uh, Georgia Satellites. Georgia Satellites, they were, they were, yeah, the Satellites, and um, 
And Brendan so, played two half stacks, two Marshall Super Leads. Yeah, that was the norm. It was and, and, so and 80s, loud. That was the norm. I remember when I moved here, all bands, you, it, if you had one half stack, you were kind of like, oh, man. Well, you know, right. You had to have like two half stacks at least. Yeah, I, now, I had two full stacks. And now, yeah. now what, what separated the, the guys from the, the, the half guys was, well, my, my amps aren't master volumes. So they would just, they would just, you know, and Brendan's was not mastering. No, would just, you know, so that was those were like, okay, that's it was you know. so loud, but it sounded so good. Yeah, right. Yeah. I would, I would never get hired again if I even showed up. <laughs> if I even like unloaded my car with a four twelve, people would be like, oh yeah, sorry, we've got we, somebody else. You know, it's kind of weird. I, I kind of the only thing I could surmise it to is, is and not to, you know blanket statement something but there's less guitar in music today yeah okay yeah the the stuff we all kind of grew up on guitar was focal point so yeah. it, you expected to be like assaulted with guitars although maybe you know. the guitar is not the focal it, point because people are not because people are playing with laptops and playing x effects and campers right. and, and and maybe that yeah and, and, and that affects, part of the yeah. you know yeah. so so my old band would have each me and the singer and I would both have two full stacks. Our bass player had two SVT eight ten cabs with heads, <laughs> oh and our drummer course. had a a Ludwig kit with a twenty six inch kick drum. So we didn't when we'd be an opener. <laughs> Why we, was the drummer even playing at that point? No, have to, <laughs> no, okay. the, the twenty six inch bass drum. So yeah. so uh, we opened for Def Leppard, for example. We did uh, ten dates with Def Leppard, and yeah. we could we you could never use a backdrop if you were an opening band. No, no. But our gear was so big, the guys would laugh the, the, that we we. Roll out the cabinets and everything, and it looked like we were the headliner. Like always. A pro band, man, look at all the gear. Right, because it would always cover the ba the headliner's gear. You couldn't see it from behind behind their stuff. That was kind of our thinking. And I remember talking to uh, to Phil Collin, I think it was from Def Leppard yeah. or whoever's. Uh, yeah, and and I said, you guys. First of all, they had the walls of Marshalls, but then they actually behind the wall, the the fake wall, they had the mm -hmm. their actual half stacks. Yeah, or full. They had a full stack. I said, you don't. Plug in the full stack. No, only the bottom one. Right. On the, uh, the first time I ever saw that done, and, and it blew my mind, was uh, I saw 38 Special one time as a kid. And they had these just peavies stacked three high all across the stage. All of them were lit up. You know, and I'm sitting on the side of the stage, and they... 112 boogie mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right here close mic with a 57 yeah. and they got two of them and that's it dude i one of the weirdest gigs i ever did was opening for some 41 in mm. charlotte and they had the same thing yeah. it was it was a wall of marshall cabs three high across the whole stage yeah. and you walk back and they're all they aren't even cabinets they're empty facades uh, right it's, it's like half of a cabinet with these guys in at the least back. had loaded stuff but no yeah, th this okay. was just a facade like a hollywood <laughs> facade and and the, the guy was running a 112 with yeah. like a, a dual rack yeah. or something. Well, like man, that. I, Billy Gibbons, perfect example. Yeah. Uh, he he's got all that stuff on stage. Underneath, he's got a, a an ISO cab with yeah. a 112 and like a 3041 amp typically, and like a JMP1 Marshall pre that goes to the board direct, and he mixes the two. Yeah. So I like. All three things. I'm. I'm a. Dude, you guys are selling me out again. No, 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 no. no. And I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. Being a producer, when I when I'm when I would track bands, I, I did 750 records, mm -hmm. and it was mostly rock bands. Yeah. Now, when I would do the all the basic tracks with the bands, I would use full amplifier. You know, whatever, whatever the. You know, sometimes we use Voxes, sometimes Marshalls. Sometimes, I mean, it could be anything. But a lot of times when I'd go back in, I'd do overdubs. If I need to do things during mix, like a special effect or something, I might use a uh, a plugin or something like that, yeah. and and put uh, and put effects and Pro Tools on it and just uh, make sounds up that way. Just yeah. do do. Um, You'd layer them. I'd layer things yeah, yeah. like that. Just uh, it might not even be, be guitar parts. It might be background effects. It could be uh, an Ebo or a. Slide, like, I, I just call it, you know, clouds of, of uh, ambience, ambience, yeah, ambience. Yeah, ambience yeah. to cut, to fill it in on like a pad, basically. Yeah, yeah, right. And the, and there's really you don't need to mic up, you know, a lot of because I would always be working by myself and not have my assistant Ken there, mm -hmm. and it would just be easier to do that. And I yeah. think that that is kind of nowadays what people people now go for the easiest thing You're well and the reality is like we can sit here and lament about about the days of of being on stage with you know 200 watt 812 rigs but the reality is 
that's just not happening anymore. And and right. I'm partially joking, but I'm partially serious. Like I, as a working gig guitar player, would not get called back if yeah. I roll oh, up I can to a gig you, like I that. I have the same. Uh, dude, I use a, I use a Tweed Deluxe. Yeah. And I run pedals in front of that because right. I can't even turn that up. Right. So, yeah. And in that case, yeah. and a, a lot more uh, bands are running in-ear monitors now and in-ear yeah. rigs. And so in that case, something like a Kemper makes perfect sense because it's a small rack mount or a small toaster. You can run stereo. If you have good sounding profiles and you know how to play the Kemper, because it is a different thing than playing a Park or a Marshall. If you know how to play the Kemper and how to work it, they can sound really great and then you're not dealing with all the trouble of the front of house guy yelling at you to turn down or the singer getting mad at you because she can't hear herself in her monitors or whatever and so and and then for fly dates or travel you know i can walk through the airport with my whole rig and and not worry about it so in, in that setting something like a kemper or even a helix or an axe effects makes total sense to have you know well i would just did a video with Sinister Gates from Avenged Sevenfold, and he's m moved to the to the X Effects now. That's he he m finally after this um, took a lot of convincing uh, for him to do that, but uh, he they modeled or profiled, I guess, or whatever they yeah. they call it. All of his sounds tone matched his right. sounds. Right. That's what the they call an X Effects with the uh, it's profiling on the Kemper. Yeah. Yeah. And he's going to go out now with his with that. And he's basically been going through all of his albums and putting together all the sounds that he needs. And it's incredibly time consuming. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. not like using these these things. It's actually easier with a real yeah, amplifier. Really is, well, I was just going to say, I just yeah. had a friend who had an experience with a Kemper and literally had it a long time and just got so fed up trying to get good sounds out of it that he did sell it and got like a Friedman yeah. on her head. And he's just like, I'm done. And he goes, some people can make them work. I'm just not that guy. And, and I get it. And you do and it. It's like you said, they have their place. They, mm -hmm. and if you, ha and you do have to know how to run them and you can't run them with the logic of, Oh, it's a tube amp. It's no, not, it's, it's not, it's completely different. And so you have I mean, to be a tweaker. You have to yes, be the type of person that's yes. going to sit there for three hours, dialing yeah. in your tones, messing with EQs right. and compression and all that stuff. If you're not that guy, I mean, yeah. Sinister Gates told me he would spend. He was spending hours of, of yeah. tweaking tones. Oh, yeah. This friend of mine actually, yeah, he he was spending yeah. weeks mm -hmm. trying to get. And one, there were yeah. so many. And the Axe Effects. The the thing about the Kemper that I like is that it's it's more like a guitar amp. Mm -hmm. The Axe Effects you have you really have to use your laptop. Yeah. Yeah. To right. uh, to uh, to tweak it and. Just like a Marshall. Just like a Marshall. <laughs> it, there are so many parameters that it, it's it's honestly it's pretty daunting. <laughs> just like a Marshall. See, you know what? Yeah, where's now? the USB plug? Actually, I just that. want that. <laughs> That's what, this is all. Now, I want. now this is interesting. So I I um, it it's, it has to say more. It should say more. So I interviewed uh, Pete Thorne, and yeah. and, and yeah. so what does Pete have for his his yeah. sir his signature? Yes, sir, yes. It's a hundred watt, right? hundred watt, yeah. and yeah. He, but he also has a UA plugin right. of it. Yes, right. so he has both. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that's just the reality of the time today. This is right. where we're headed. Um, no, that's where where we're at. We're well, at. exactly. But even <laughs> even it's becoming because okay, I've had a I've had the Kemper. I actually bought the Kemper from you. Yes, like five years ago, something. And like that. At, just to tell the story, I bought the Kemper because I was going up to Nashville doing a lot of songwriting, thinking that, okay, I'm going to use. I I would make up, put together tracks doing country songwriting. I go in and they, you, publishing company would put you with two other writers, and you go into a room and then I would play them demos of tracks that I yeah. was working yeah. on, and they yeah. say, oh, I like that, I like that, and I was thinking, okay, I'm going to use the Kemper if I want to change stuff. They want to change chords or change you know guitar parts or whatever, but. I ended up never having enough room to set the stuff up because the rooms they yeah, put you in at these publishing companies were so small. And they're always the people, trash, too. It's like, they're always trash. Yeah. They'd have a crappy electric piano <laughs> yeah. in there, digital yeah, yeah, piano. Yeah, yeah. And I put my Kemper on a rack, and I couldn't even set up my right, laptop. Right, yeah. so, I, so I sold it to Ray. But well, even like five years ago when I got it, the Kemper has was... It been a, that long? Yeah, it has. And yeah. it's it's... It, when I got it, it was kind of a, a niche thing. They like, just come out, really. But yeah, now, just dude, them. they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's forums and Facebook groups about them. And so when I look at the next five years, I mean, I think this trend is going to continue, and we're going to see less 
bands and less guitar players using stuff like this live and this kind of stuff I think is going to start to become more relegated to studio use well and I think term. too I, I think the other thing is is a few things too where most people are going to you know write music and all that you can't turn up you're mm -hmm. an apartment you're you know mm -hmm. so that's the big that's a big factor right there so how do you emulate a loud amp yeah you get you know um, and then the other thing is most people are doing the producer role yeah. Not right. only am I playing everything and writing everything, but I'm doing everything else. And when you're in that mode, you you know, it's a whole different thing. You're not going to be coming out here, let's change cabinets, let's go yeah. for that speed. It's like, no, I need to focus on this and get this done and then worry about that stuff later. Well, and, and it's convenience. It's a, you know. Well, there was a there's a transition period from everybody knows I love grunge and I love, you know, I, I love 70s rock, which was really grunge is 70s 70s yeah. rock. Yeah. And um, or late '60s, '70s rock, and then so I was in a band in the starting in the mid '90s and '97, and grunge really stopped around '94, '95. Down on the Upside was one of the last big grunge records, and you couldn't find producers or people that had worked uh, that to work on. You know, when I was going to the studios this is before I knew how to record people that actually recorded rock records. It was it was hard to find. You didn't know that rock was going to come back again. And yeah, right. and nowadays, you know, rock will come back again at some point. It's not always mm -hmm. all going to be Max Martin tracks or yeah. or, yeah. Uh, or well, yeah, I mean, you're, and you're progressive, seeing, and you're progressive seeing metal. You're seeing it now. You're starting to see bands. Yeah. Like, you know, so it's... it's I mean, Rival Sons and all those kinds yeah, of Yeah, Rival Sons. I mean, and, the Black Keys since 2010 <coughs> have, have kind of kept that going. Arctic Monkeys with their last couple right. of records. I mean, bands like Muse. I mean, it's, Yeah, right. Um, and they are guitar based bands. Of course, Muse started you know, in 99 or so. Right. Yeah, but they're still. All right, we'll, we'll go with the Greta Van Fleet then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That don't start that debate, please. He, well, he uses a real amp, he uses a real guitar. I'll give him credit for that and, you know, whatever. It's all. It's all. That's, that's, opinion, next, and that's all I'm going to say about it. But That's our know. next video. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so, you know, the, at some point, we're going to come back to this now. Are people going to use amplifiers? Well, people that, that have the studio space for it yeah. and that we're going yeah. to actual recording yeah. studios mm -hmm. yeah. will probably use real amps and, and probably use, you know, things like uh, Kempers and XFX. I, my assistant, Ken, and I have been uh, making profiles of, for his, he has a Kemper. I don't own a Kemper. But I have profiles, or I'm making profiles of with him of every amp that's in here. Yeah. And I sell profiles on, um, I think, in my store, or maybe on Flat Five. <laughs> well, no, there, no, we do, we are selling. Yeah, Red has profiles. Yeah, he sells he's got, too. Right, yeah, right. But I have profiles of oh, probably about seven or eight amps right now. But we have many more to go through. Yeah. We're kind of gradually adding to that, and yeah. and uh, it, it's do they sound exactly the same? No, they don't. Mm -hmm. They're very close, though. Um, I'm going to make a video on it. I yeah, mean, do, does it? Does it? Here's the thing: is that the differences in the sound from from the from the uh, real amp to the to these other things is once you start, you know, if they sound different, then. A lot of the stuff you would make up in just how you're putting the sound together. If I'm micing up a real amp and I get a sound, or if I take a Kemper sound or something, I'm going to tweak the things to to yeah. where I think they sound good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not it's not it's not like you're going to say, "Here's my Kemper profile and here's the real amp that I've just profiled." Well, I'm going to go back and forth between the two. Well, you wouldn't really do that. Yeah, for it's in the profiles that I've made. You know, you spend all this time trying to get exactly like the amp, but then you come back a day or a week later to actually use the profiles and you've lost that sound in your head of what the real amp actually sounds like and you just go straight to the profile and do all your tweaking. Yeah. And the other thing too is in, in a live context, the reason this stuff makes so much sense live is because that five to maybe 10% difference between the real amp and the Kemper is gonna be completely lost in the context of a live mix. Right. In a house, when people are listening, I challenge anyone to go to a show and see someone playing a real amp or a Kemper and think, oh man, you know what, that show really would have been better if, if that was a real Tweed Deluxe. The only thing I can say different on that, and it's, and it's from the player standpoint, it's not from the audience right. standpoint, is what I've noticed is the attack is completely different on a Kemper and Helix and those kind of things. Like the transient, like when yes, you get... Yeah. It's, that's what I notice most. About you mean an attack to you? That yes, as you're, as you're playing. playing. It's a completely different feel. 
and yeah. you do adjust your playing to it. Right. And, and what I find for myself is when I'm using one of those, I don't play anywhere near as aggressive. I don't. Yeah. I, it's like I'm just sort of like, oh, I don't have to. Where these, what you dig in, what you put in is what you get out a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's just a different feel. But yeah, the audience is not going to really know any. Right. Well, that's what I was saying earlier. Like you have to change how you play yeah. when you're playing through yes. a digital rig because it's a different thing. Yeah, it's you're, completely. Yeah, it you're is. playing. You know, zeros and ones versus uh, you know transformers and yeah. and tubes. Yeah. You yeah. Know, yeah. Like it's, it's completely yeah. different. But yeah. It is. I don't necessarily think it's worse or, or uh, I, I think the difference is negligible. You just have to be aware of it and adjust to it. Yeah. Well, the convenience factor is really why people, this, this is why it's changed. That's why it started. Is that, that it, that it now, you know, it really started with the, you know, with the pods back yeah. in the, in the probably 99 when they first Dude, came out. Even before and that, the Rockman. The Rockman. That That's was right. That was the first one. That was the first one. Because you, I remember going to big studios when I even when I worked at Triclops here. You know, you had people, all this stuff. People you'd bring a Rockman in, and we rack mounted a Rockman, yeah. and people, and you plug into that, and you go. That's exactly the clean sound I want. <laughs> and we'd go, there you go. And we'd yeah. run it through the Neve, and it was like, what did you guys use for well, that? Well, even, yeah, you mean, know, even historically, you know, uh, some people would just plug right into a, a you know, LA-2A or 1176 yeah. without, Dude, or plug right I mean, into the Nile console. Nile Rogers, man. I mean, Nile Rogers. That's, so, that's all, right. That sound is a combination of the board and yeah. a Vibrolux. But why, do, why would they go in? Why Dude, would people do that? They did it for convenience then, even. Perfect example. David Gilmour, another brick in the wall with solo, direct into the board mm -hmm. without an amp. And he basically said they were just like so fed up, I guess, with time. And he's like, we got to get it. The, and they just ran it direct. And, and it's an iconic so it's always, tone. It's always been for convenience. It has. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. It doesn't, right. So, but to me, the, the Rockman was really the first one that was like, you couldn't believe one that you could walk around with this thing on, right. you know, like, you know, and play like, you know, it was way ahead like a, of a pig nose, which was the iconic first one. But that was, you know, way before that. But, but now it's, you know, now we're, we're so beyond that. But, but the Rockman for years, yeah. I mean, I, all the Boston records, 80% of what you heard in top People 40. People wanted ready, to, 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 they wanted, they wanted to record, that sound. Yeah, they wanted to and record you, through those things. And every time I hear like an 80s song, I, I can always get that's a Rockman. Like you can just, it, when you know that sound, you just go, yeah, that's, that's totally a Rockman, you know. But but is the is is the convenience factor of having your um, you know your your uh, Helix for example or your Kemper or your Axe Effects the fact that they're right there mm -hmm. uh, contribute to the types of sounds that that people use in pop music for example versus I mean honestly most of the the gent bands the really heavy progressive metal bands use axe effects mm -hmm. yeah all, 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 all the band that's all they use right well because that kind of digital modeling lends itself to that super tight like sharp transient sharp kind of, transient type bottom end yeah. right where you don't have to really see that's where the convenience of that really comes in because trying to get a heavy sound on a real tube amp as you know yeah it's a lot of work it's yeah. a lot of work it, mm -hmm. it's, to get it tight, to get it compressed right, to get to where it sits in the mix right, where it cuts right, mm -hmm. where those like the Kemper and the Helix up, it's I well, mean, you can really dial that up, and that's really right there. Well, one of the things with it is that that people, as you tune lower and lower, you have to really cut the bottom end of the guitar, yeah. which I would always do with the distortion box. Right. Before it goes in, you take some of the low end away so the amp isn't reproducing all the mud on the bottom end. Yeah. And that's the thing that people don't realize that that they have to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's why um, Misha from from um, Periphery from Periphery has his uh, Horizon pedal that actually has the low the high pass filter on it mm -hmm. to filter the bottom end for people that use seven string guitars, eight string yeah, guitars, yeah. things like that. Because yeah. right. he knows that when you go into an amp, you need to roll off the bottom end right. of the guitar if it's right. tuned really low. Yeah. So my my question then is, so we we can all acknowledge that yes, there's a difference, a, a an audible and tangible difference between. The digital modeling stuff and the real thing. Are we ever going to get to the point, and if so, when are we going to get to the point where the difference is totally negligible to the listener and the player? It'll get there. It'll get there. Yeah, I yeah. agree. But I, I, I just, I don't know how far. Are we three years away from that, or are we thirteen years away from well, that? Well, like, I think, I think that you'll, you'll have people out there that say, well, there's no difference right now. That computers yeah, are fast right. enough. There's plenty of people, but. 
there's people, you know, you know, if I ask Pete Thorne, what, which if he'd rather play through his plug-in or his real amp, he's probably going to say his real amp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though I know he likes his plug-in a lot and he uses it and yeah. it sounds great. Well, and, and you know, I mean, the other way we can look at it too, it's like, um, have we ever had this much flexibility? No. Yeah, and I actually, it's you amazing, know, actually. I will say that is it's kind endless. of a big I mean, downside really yeah. of using something like the Kemper or the Helix is you have so many options available to you that whenever I'm recording or trying to write a part, I will spend so much time flipping through my 800 profiles on my Kemper trying to find the right thing. Whereas when I'm in the studio with a, a real amp, it's just, okay, cool, well, I'm going to make this amp work. I'm going to mic it up and do what I need to do, and it's yeah. a lot quicker, and it's more decisive. It's like the reamping thing. If you know you have the option to go back and tweak that amp later, you're a lot less likely to commit to a sound going in. Well, it's funny because I have a reamp box, and I almost never reamp. Yeah. I would just re-record it. Yeah. I would reamp a bass. Now, that that's different yeah. to me, but... Yeah. The one thing we didn't talk about is the proliferation of great foot pedals. Now, oh, yeah. That, that because of people wanting to have particular amp sounds, you have all these different kind of pedals that... that uh, Amp in the box pedals. Amp in the yeah. box pedals. That yeah. you play through a clean amplifier, like a like a deluxe or something, and you set it to clean, you use the amp, and it, it creates a Dumble or it creates a Marshall or it creates a... You know, or, or it tries to mimic those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, again, we're kind of in that same territory where it's like, yeah, it gets really close. The best ones out there can, can get, you know, pretty close. But, again, unless, like Dave says, you're, if you're not moving that air and you're not hitting those transformers and, and those, the power section of that amp, a pedal going into a clean, quiet amp is not going to do the same thing as a JTM 45 dimed. Yeah, of course you know? not. Yeah, and, 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 you know, as long as... You know that going into it, you yeah. know. Um, I, un unfortunately, you know, a lot of companies use terminology that the <laughs> to people who don't know the difference. Unfortunately, they you know people get took like, well, I can buy this box and just get this. Well, you can't, but you can at least get a, de a better sound out of maybe just sort of a straight clean amp. You can actually just plug this in and, and get something better than just a straight amp itself. But again, it's I think even the pedals have come so far in the last just even the last five to ten years. Yeah, I mean, even like in the mid '90s, you know, you had, you know, pedals were kind of on a resurgence because everybody was buying the old stuff from the '60s, yeah. and then everybody started kind of figuring out, well, like, well, those circuits really aren't that hard to mimic. Let's just, you know, and so you had all these guys starting to tinker on, and then you had guys modding like Healy and and. Analog Man and those kind of guys yeah. doing, you know, really good mods to pedals that were great and making them even better. Yeah. Which, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sort of a vintage snob to a point, but I also, you know, if something's been modded and it's better than the original, man, I'll take the modded any day. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and I know people are, oh, I wouldn't mess with it. You know, make it better. You know, I mean, a perfect yeah. example, that, that park camp we were just talking about, that thing is dead quiet when you have it nailed all the yeah. way up, whereas I've owned original ones of those and it's psh yeah. <laughs> you know, which is fine, but yeah. it is amazing. I was like, "Wow, this is I mean, amazingly yeah, quiet." That amp you is know. So, but question though, Dave, would that Park amp when they were brand new sound like that back in the you know? No, they were. St I think they were still a little loud. I mean, I've had some really mint examples yeah. that were, you know, they were just light, you know, noisy. You know? Yeah. I mean, so I'm, and it also depends on who's you know building it and all that kind of thing. Tolerances, obviously. So, but um, but it is to me, it's amazing though that I mean, we're we're sitting here. You know, if you would have told me 30 years ago, we've been talking about, you know, simulated amps versus real amps versus, uh, it's crazy. I mean, it's just really. We live in know. a golden age of gear. Man. Yeah. For, I mean, I tell people all the time, they're like, oh, well, you know, kind of guitars kind of on the way out. But I'm like, yeah, but we've never had this much no, it's amazing. stuff it's to mess with. Yeah. And I almost feel like it's kind of like, well, you know, it's like you said, it's got to turn back around somewhat even more because I think. We're in the, we're in that gold another golden age. We're in well, this this, dude, this second. And, and you know. not to get too far off topic, but just to speak to that, you know, I watched the Grammys two weeks ago, and this is the first Grammy Awards I've seen in maybe the last five years where there was a guitar being played in almost every performance, and I'm seeing a lot more female artists. A lot of female are, artists. Yeah, a lot of female artists who Great. are out front playing guitars and playing like actually yeah. killing yeah. it and. And, you know, I think guitar is not dead. Guitar is not on the way out. It's just changing and evolving as yeah. it always has and always yeah, does. Sure. And this kind of gear is, is part of that. 
I dude, I saw Kimper being played behind Warren yeah. by by yeah. her. Uh, yeah. She put on a killer performance, and she was playing, and right behind her was her Kimper, and it sounded cool, and right. it worked. And if that is what's going to help keep this instrument relevant for the next fifty years, I don't right. care. Yeah, you play whatever you want. Well, the best part is they both can live next to each other. Yeah. all of this stuff can live with each other. You can't, and you can't have one without the other. Right. You can't have a Kemper without a bunch of really good amps to to, to model. Right. Off yeah. Of. So and yeah. vice versa, it's kind of like it's going to get to the point where the Kemper will probably have another thing of its own that these obviously can't do and, and so it's it's I've always you know. been one I've always owned everything I've always had the 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 real things I've had the digital things and yeah. I like having options yeah of what to go to yeah so I'm curious to know what you all think leave your comments in the comments section are you a big amp small amp no amp all the above all, all the above, above. <laughs> let us know I'd like to thank Dave you can find Dave on his Facebook. Dojo uh, Guitar Repair. Facebook. I'll, I'll put the, the uh, link in the description. And Rhett? Uh, YouTube. I make videos about guitar. Yes. Subscribe to Rhett's channel. It'll be in the description, too. Thanks for watching. The Beato Cups. Oh, Beato Cups. Beato Cups. By the way, these are the uh, the Beato Scale mugs. Well, you guys argue it makes the water taste better. <laughs>